breaks the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place
Well, good morning, church. Welcome to Second Branch online only service. It is Palm Sunday, April the 5th, 2020. You just got to listen and hopefully worship uh, along with music with my daughter, Taylor, and my son-in-law, Hunter, and they're in from Chicago and enjoying the stay at home at our house. And it's good to see them home and to have them close by. I want to say a quick thank you to all of those members that have taken up our challenge of calling people checking in to see how they're doing. Uh, I know that I've talked with several people that were so uh, grateful for that contact, and I hope that you'll keep that up. We're prioritizing three things over the next couple months until we can get a sense of what normalcy will look like. We are emphasizing a care for our membership, so that's why we're encouraging people to contact each other. We're trying to do Zoom Sunday school classes. Hopefully some of you were able to turn into that today and uh, we're, our deacons are still active and are doing a fantastic job. And we're hoping to begin releasing some weekly Facebook posts or maybe uh, multiple times a week, some Facebook posts. Belinda and I are talking about doing some fun things like uh, a baby picture contest or things that just help us tune in to each other and connect over the internet. And uh, it is kind of a strange time, isn't it? We're prioritizing care for members. We're also prioritizing our finances. So we're looking at ways that we can uh, cut costs and save money. So our air conditioning and heat have been turned off in the main buildings um, to try to conserve energy. And we are um, electing to work from home as much as possible. 
and uh, we're probably going to need to be looking at amending our budget um, because we just need to be prepared in the event that um, our economy does not pick back up and we need to continue our, our church on. Along those lines, thank you so much for the people that have mailed in uh, their checks or even dropped them off here at the office, um, their tithes and offerings. We're very grateful for that. It's a hard time for many people, and we want to be able to continue to minister to those that are in need. So thank you so much, uh, those of you who are not hurting and continuing to support our ministries here. Uh, very, very, very grateful for that. So we're prioritizing conserving money and, and our finances. There's some things with the banks that we're checking into to see if there's an, a way that we can uh, do a better job of that. Uh, so we're prioritizing care for members, prioritizing managing our finances well, and we're also prioritizing our community. We need to be prepared, whether it's through our benevolence ministry or um, we're gonna continue to support our missionaries abroad and our missionaries at home, like Joel Hughes and Tri Hope Ministry. Um, so we need to prioritize that. We may find out there are people in our neighborhoods that are negatively and adversely affected by a loss of job or something along the lines. And we wanna be prepared to respond appropriately. So um, we're still managing our finances, uh, but we're, we're doing that in a way that can help us prioritize our community still. Every church in our area is faced with the same situation, and we are uh, looking at how to do ministry in a new new normal. Um, so this week, I want to just dive back into the series that we were teaching before um, this coronavirus pandemic hit us and affected us. We were in a series called Jesus, the Forgotten Son, and um, or the Only Forgotten Son. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to John chapter 12. You may not have been expecting that. So I'll give you just a little bit of time to turn on your smart device, scroll to the book of John chapter 12, or open up your hard copy Bible. I'm using mine here on my iPad. And as you're turning to John 12, and we're looking at when Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem, and, uh, and from the premise of the only forgotten son. We're looking at things that maybe people have forgotten about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem or drawing some applications from that. But as you're still turning there, or maybe you're ready, um, there's a pastor in Texas. His name is Tony Evans. Uh, and I love reading a lot that he's written and watching things that he says. And here's one of the things that he was saying recently. People are looking for answers. And there's only two. There's God's answer and everybody else's, and everybody else is wrong. I love that. Um, sometimes people try to make sense of God's direction and his leading, and they can't do it. Uh, God's direction makes sense because of where it came from, not because they can understand it. And that was a paraphrase of a sermon that Tony Evans gave. And I thought that that was just extremely relevant to today's uh, situation with this coronavirus and looking at um, our passage of scripture here in John 12, people looking for answers and they try to make their own and they're always wrong. So let's, uh, let's look here at John chapter 12. I'm reading from the NIV. You may be reading from a different translation, so it will sound different. Uh, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. You remember that story, hopefully. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Just time out real quick. I wonder if John knew that prior to Jesus giving him the task of writing this gospel. Did the disciples know that Judas Iscariot was robbing 
the money bag before he betrayed? It's hard to tell. Uh, I've always wondered that when I've read that. Pick up back in verse 7. Jesus says, Leave her alone. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. Keep going in verse 12. The next day, the, crowd, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. And at first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed the sign, went out to meet him. Verse 19, So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Verse 20, Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to the worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus, and Jesus replied, My hour or the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven came and said, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. And Jesus said, this was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the, the kind of death he was going to die. And that's uh, where we're going to stop today. I want to just, um, if you're taking notes at home, um, I'm going to give you some things to write down here. There are things in here that I personally forget about. And then I read it and I just kind of gloss over it. And and in preparation for today, I thought it would be good if we just pointed out some things that are really important to remember. Here's some things about uh, people forgetting about Jesus. In verse 4, Judas is only worried about money. And at this stage in the game, it's the week before the crucifixion. Judas has had about three to four years of watching Jesus do all kinds of miracles. Why in the world would Judas be so concern about money when he had seen such amazing things done? The obvious answer is he completely forgotten about all of that. It made no difference in his life. He saw it, forgot it, walked away and said, I'm only interested in, in my money. I find it also really important that the chief priests had not forgotten what Jesus had done. So you have this, this paradox that, that Judas Iscariot, known as the betrayer, is going to turn Jesus over to the chief priests. Judas, completely careless about any of the miracles that had been done, all he's interested in is his wallet. And he's selling Jesus to the chief priests who remember everything that he's done. So the, what a paradox. One person betrays Jesus, having spent three to four years following him around, only focused on himself, though, and sells him to a group of people that know everything that Jesus is doing, but they too are only interested in their own uh, grab or hold on the leadership that they have. So uh, it, very interesting to point out here that Judas had forgotten about the miracles that Jesus had done. 
In verses 9 through 11, take a look at that. Verse 9 says this, A large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So um, it's interesting to see that the, a forgotten story here is when the chief priests found out that Jesus and Lazarus were there with him, who they remember, uh, unlike Judas, that, that Lazarus was dead and was now alive. Verse 11 says this, On account of him, many Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. And the chief priests are upset about this. So look at that verse 10 sandwich in the middle. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. Did you remember that? We, we often think that the chief priests are, yeah, they're bad people and they're wanting to kill Jesus. But Lazarus was a person who was sick. That was the recipient of God's grace through the healing of Jesus. And Lazarus was telling people about it. So the chief priests say, wow, Jesus has to go. But so does Lazarus. And the only claims that Lazarus was making was, I was dead and now I'm not. And everybody knew that in Bethany. In fact, this, this passage says that the people that were there wanted to come see Lazarus alive because they had already heard that he was dead. So it's unbelievable to me to think that the chief priests, they were not only trying to kill Jesus, but also Lazarus just because the guy was alive, right? So it's like, Lazarus, you are already dead. You deserve to be dead. We're going to come and kill you too because you shouldn't be alive right now. It's, it's absolutely crazy. Uh, another thing here comes in verse 13 that, uh, that I think is important to remember. And maybe, maybe you've forgotten about this. But in verse 13 in uh, chapter 12, it says this. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna. Now, the, the Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Very, very powerful declaration of who Jesus is out of the mouths of the Jews. And I don't think we've forgotten that. And we probably haven't forgotten that there were palm branches that were laid down also. But uh, the palm branch is a symbol in an ancient Greek history, back in the time when Jesus was alive and predating that, the palm branch had a specific symbolism for, for the people there. And the Jews were living in that same culture and they owned what the symbol of a palm branch was. It was a symbol of victory and a symbol of peace. So here's Jesus who's going to come in as a king marching into the capital city of Israel, Jerusalem. And the people are laying palm branches down. It's Palm Sunday. They're laying palm branches down because it is a symbol of victory and peace. Ironic that the people who were looking for the Messiah to be a powerful ruler who would come in a warrior and take over the Roman government, kick out the Caesars and, and say, I'm establishing my military dominance on this land, just like our, our uh, people of old, Joshua and Caleb and, and those guys in, uh, in the Old Testament days, came in and had a military conquest. This is who the Messiah will be. And that was what the people were thinking. And yet in demonstrating what they already know, they're laying down palm branches, which are a symbol of victory and peace. Essentially saying, you have already won your kingdom and you did it peacefully. That's amazing. And I, I think that we forget sometimes the significance of the palm branch being laid down on the streets of Jerusalem as they're coming in. Something else that I think is, um, is important to note here, and that comes in verses 14 and 15. And it is, let me get there. It says, verse 14, Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. This is a, a, a dual symbolism here. A colt also being not a grandstanding chariot or some significant military coming. It's a small little pony almost. And Jesus is riding in on it. Not a dominant animal, just a little slowpoke little thing that wouldn't outrun a herd of, of sheep probably. But Jesus is coming in on that, again showing that he's not coming to be a military leader. He's coming not to win a physical war. He's coming to win a spiritual war by doing that with self-sacrifice. So, uh, and the donkey also is a symbol of humility. 
rather than coming in on a steed, rather than coming in on a giant horse, comes on this little small, small animal, a, uh, a bookend to how he entered the world. He entered the world as a small baby. He's going to begin his uh, kingdom reign coming in with lots of humility. So that's something that I think uh, is important for us to remember. And then I have uh, uh, jumped past verse 11. Take a look at verse 11. This is um, what it says here. Uh, let me get to it again. Verse 11 says this. On account of him, meaning Lazarus, on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. So Jesus is there. He's visiting Lazarus and Mary and Martha, all, all siblings. And Lazarus has been telling people about Jesus. And people are believing in Jesus on Lazarus's account. So the thing that I think that we forget sometimes and how we forget Jesus' life and his ministry life, we forget that the message of hope was preached by Lazarus, not just by Jesus. And that's despite the circumstances. Lazarus was telling people, hey, look, I, I, was, I was dead. I faced a significant life-ending illness. It took my life from me. And even though I was in the dire uh, state that I am, Jesus came and gave me life, not just earthly life, but he gave me eternal life by my belief in him. And that's a message of hope that I cannot stop talking about. So chief priests, you want to take my life? No worries. I've already lost it once and I'm learning Jesus gives life and his life lasts eternally. So uh, I think that we forget that. And the application that I think we can take away from that is God's plan has always involved us taking the message of Jesus to the world despite the circumstances. So here we are in 2020 in April. We have this, this terrible pandemic that's, uh, th that's going on. Every day we turn on the news and find out more people are infected and more people have died. I just found out today that um, one of my uh, very distant family members by marriage uh, lost as, as a nurse, lost her life uh, to the coronavirus this week. So it's, um, it's, it, it, it's just a season of bad news almost. But despite the circumstances, just like Lazarus, the message of Jesus and hope has always been left on the shoulders of the people who are following him. That didn't change. So um, we can follow Lazarus' lead doing that same thing. So um, the riding on the donkey, again, is a symbol of peace. But it was also a fulfillment of prophecy um, that, that God said from the book of Isaiah that there was going to be a Messiah coming in and he would ride in in humility on a donkey, not taking this, this um, uh, city by force, but establishing his kingdom with peace from a not a, a physical and forceful fight, but a spiritual battle fought with mercy, grace, and sacrifice. I think we forget that sometimes. And so the message was, um, or the, the message series was called Jesus, the forgotten son or the only forgotten son. These are some things in John chapter 12 that I think that we forget at times. Now I, I want to draw some applications from that. When I'm looking at this, I find that there are four types of people that are in this passage of John 12. Number one, there are those who admire Jesus and what he can do but they don't really follow him fully. When you look at chapter 12, verse 9, chapter 12, verse 9 says, A large crowd of, G of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of Jesus, they also wanted to see Lazarus. So pause. They're following Jesus. They see the things that he's doing. But they're also really interested in somebody else. So if Jesus wasn't there, their interest would still be. We, we want to go see this guy, Lazarus. It's all about the kind of like the sideshow, Barnum and Bailey uh, Circus or, or uh, whatever, the, the bearded lady or something. You know, we, we want to see this strange sight. So there are people who, are, who, who admire Jesus, but they're not necessarily following him. These are uh, people that are willing to listen to whatever voice seems the most interesting at the time. 
People like this are shallow theologically. They have little to no personal desire to really know Jesus fully. They might be spiritual, but they can be led into an incorrect spiritual belief by others that can sound compelling. So oftentimes I will hear people who will quote someone that sounds really good, but that person's theology is terrible. Um, there are people that will teach the Bible and don't even believe that it's true. They'll still teach it. And then I'll hear people who call themselves Christians will quote individuals like that and say, wow, you know, this guy's just got such a great message or she's so amazing of a communicator. And it's like, yeah, she or he is really interesting to listen to. And they, ask, they say some really good things, but they're wrong. <laughs> they're, they're not even teaching accurate biblical truths. And, and there are people that will follow a voice, no matter what that voice is saying. And I hope that the members of our church are not like that. If you're following a voice, then let me tell you, mine is not one that's easy to listen to. I've got this weird southern uh, northwestern Virginia Hills accent. I sound like a hillbilly sometimes. Um, I don't have a compelling voice to listen to. So if you're looking for an awesome voice, there are a lot of churches around here that have some really great communicators. Um, so don't be a person who's just looking for someone to admire. That's what some people were like. There is another group of people that I find here in John 12, those who have experienced what Jesus have, has done, and yet they forget about him. That's Judas Iscariot. Uh, they betray their faith when something shiny catches their eyes. These people can be Christians or they can be non-Christians, but they are led by their senses, led by the, the quest for more money, more fame, more success. They're people who have seen God at work in either their lives or someone else's life and they just forget about it. That's a group of people that I see here in John 12. There's another group, those people who absolutely hate what Jesus is doing. They're the chief priests in John 12, chapter 12, verse 10, and they do everything that they can to stop the work of Jesus. And I can promise you these people are most definitely not Christians, and they can even appear to have strong faith or even be in leadership positions inside of a church. They go to church regularly, they have important positions. They can, uh, they can look and sound exactly like they're supposed to, but on the inside, their heart is against anything pertaining to God's true work of redemption for people. Power has become their God, and it ultimately stems from a desire of self instead of a desire for Jesus. And once the work of Jesus begins, just like in John 12, once the work of Jesus begins, they'll do anything to get it to stop, even trampling on the lives of other people to do so. So in today's world, you don't have necessarily, uh, in America at least, you don't have murderous villains running around the streets, killing people, claiming to be pastors of churches or Sunday school teachers of churches, killing people in order to try to keep them quiet. That doesn't happen in America. It's a little bit more deceptive in America. You have people that are in churches that can be pastors and they can be uh, teachers or leaders in the church, or just people that are bench warmers. Uh, they can talk the talk, and they look like they're walking the walk, but whenever God's work really starts happening, they'll trample a person's reputation in a heartbeat. I have experienced people like that. You've experienced people like that. I pray you're not one of those people. But when God's work starts going, people start going against it, and that's, that's the group of people that inside a church can be one of the most destructive forces um, that's there. They'll do everything they can to stop the ministry of God going forth. Um, and then there's a fourth group. There's a fourth group, and that is the people who will follow Jesus no matter what. They'll follow Jesus no matter what. And I, I think that there are times when I could fit into every one of those categories. Even today, I could fit into one of those groups. But the goal is to go to the last group and say, what can I do to follow Jesus no matter what? So where you are at home, what can you do? Can you contact people and ask them how they're doing and then help share the message of Jesus and hope, saying, look, this is a temporary issue. 
But I can tell you about Jesus who has a long-term solution for peace of heart that you'll never be able to overcome. Or you can uh, help someone who's in need. You find out that there's someone who's in need and say, wow, serving Jesus means I have to sacrifice? Okay, I'll do that. Um, So I'm praying that you'll be challenged to look at these four groups of people and say, where am I? Am I in the group that admires Jesus? But I'm really just an admirer of any good communicator. I'm an admirer of anybody who's got a good thought. I'm not real deep myself, even though I claim to be spiritual. There is no depth to my spirituality. Is that you? Then I would encourage you to identify that, repent from that, and ask God to help you begin growing deeper in his word into a deeper relationship with him. Or maybe you're a person who has experienced Jesus in the past, but you've kind of forgotten about that. Maybe you've walked away from him. And I want to call for you to repent from that also. Ask God to forgive you from walking away, for forgetting what he's done for you, and uh, and then turn back to Jesus. Maybe you're um, in the third group of people that you see the things that God is doing or is wanting to do in your church, your place of worship, and you're being convicted right now that you're always against that. Maybe it's because you don't actually have a relationship with God. Maybe you fooled yourself into thinking you remember praying a prayer when you were eight years old, but you look now and see you're actually against what God is trying to accomplish. I pray that if that's you, you'll repent and ask God into your life today. Uh, Or maybe you're a person who is uh, desiring to follow Jesus and you're doing everything in your heart to do that. And I just want to encourage you as well to not give up. So uh, that's our message this week. It's we try to keep it short for you, and um, but still challenging. So I want to encourage you to do, do some homework. Read the book of John this week. There's 21 chapters, or maybe just read chapter 12 over and over again and ask God to help you find things that maybe you've forgotten about the story of Jesus that he wants you to know for your life today. This last thing that I want to leave you with is this. God has a plan for you. And that plan is to bring you hope, peace, and not necessarily financial wealth or physical prosperity. But God's plan for you is a spiritual hope, a journey that he has you on, that he wants to lead you into the place that he lives called heaven. So if you've never asked God in your life, I want to ask you to bow your heads with me right now and just pray this prayer. Lord God, I am in need of you. And I'm asking for you to enter my life today. Please help me to know what kind of life it is that you're asking me to live, what tasks you're wanting me to do, what heart change I need to have. Uh, But God, ultimately, I want the peace that only comes from Jesus. I want to commit my life to you. I want to ask you now to become the master and savior of my life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that, I'd like to know about it. Send me an email, info at secondbranch.org. We'd like to be able to celebrate with you. The Bible says that when one person asks Christ into their life, heaven throws a party. Let us know if we can help you in any way. And Second Branch family, we love you. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Let me tell you this as a last thing. Our, our hope is to do a drive-in service for Easter. So tell your friends and family, your neighbors, come to church with me on Easter. You can ride separately in your car. We'll be able to tune in the radio to our our message and our music. And we'll probably set up a a worship team on the bandwagon. Um, We'll call it the bandwagon, at least. It's a hay wagon. And uh, and worship together on Easter Sunday, next Sunday, April the 12th. If you're not able to come out or you're a little scared about that, we'll record that and we'll put it up later that day. We may be able to live stream that. We're still working out the details. But... Our plan is to do drive-in church next Sunday. We'll see you then.